Hey everyone, my name is Surojit Roy and I'm the co-founder of Firesco Interactive. Well, I was the co-founder of Firesco Interactive until about two months ago, but I'm not anymore. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. For now, I just want to say that it's such a pleasure to be back speaking at Hyper Games Conference again. As you guys know, this is by far the, mo the best and most relevant conference if you're in, a, in the space of hyper casual games, whether it's publishing, development, or maybe even on the network side. You make a lot of friends here in the industry. Uh, you make a lot of friends here uh, as a developer, as a publisher. You build connections that last you for many years. Our friends, Vlada and Polina, might actually be the most well-connected people in the industry today. Now, I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of you online um, in Hypercasual at this conference for the last couple of years. You may have messaged me uh, on Pine, or you may have gotten in touch on LinkedIn. Uh, but it's been a great pleasure to meet all of you here, you know, a lot of like-minded folks who love this industry and I'm sure when we finally do get to meet at a physical Hyper Games conference uh, once more, I think it will be a blast for all of us. So, now onto the presentation that I have for you today uh, and we're going to be talking about our game Head Eye. Head Eye, a third hit game at Fire Sports and probably our toughest challenge yet. Before we jump into Head Eye though, I want to quickly run you through the story of Firesco until we reach this point. You know, it's important because uh, Head Eye is the result of a story that uh, took place over about 18 months and I know that some of you have heard this story before at the last Hyper Games conference, but I urge you to bear with me so that we can, you know, take the other users through a little bit of a rewind so that we can get to this point and uh, go beyond it. So, today we're talking about Head Eye, but again, like I said, I want to take you through the story of Firesco first, and that's where we're going to start. So, Firesco was co-founded by Karan Kherajani and myself. Uh, the company started in 2018, and uh, you know, we, we were just a few of us working in a small basement office a seven member team. Um, most of the team itself had been working in the industry for many years before. Uh, they were working in the games industry on casual games, uh, you know, all kinds of games within casual. And uh, the team and some of the team had also been working together for many of those years. So the company started in 2018 and we began testing games in the hyper casual. Um, you know, we tested nine or ten games and um, after not having too much success but still coming close, we switched direction and we started working on a single product. Uh, that means the whole team was working together now on one single uh, game. And we spent almost an entire year working on this single product before realizing it wasn't really going anywhere. Now, at this point, the company was out of money, but we were saved by a deal from our publishers, Crazy Labs, uh, who weren't our publishers then, but who we had just managed to strike uh, deal with that will keep the company alive. Now, we didn't know it back then, but Firescore and Crazy Labs were set to do some really amazing things together in the coming months and the coming years. Um, and this was proven with our first game which was launched just a few months after we signed this deal. Uh, the game was called Soap Cutting and it was launched on Christmas Day 2019. Uh, Soap Cutting was the number one app and game on Christmas Day in the US and it was a huge moment for a small team like ours. We beat Amazon, YouTube, Snapchat, Disney, TikTok and this lasted all the way into the New Year. We were on the top charts uh, as you can see uh, in the number one spot in apps and games um, which again it was, it was huge for us. Uh, the game itself this was a smooth, satisfying, meditative ASMR experience. And we know that people are still playing this game around the world. Now the first big hit is always something special. But who knew it would come from a game about making, about cutting soaps. So after soap cutting became a big global success, we started working on our next ideas. And we started working on a bunch of different ideas together. Uh, you know, we had been used to as a team working on one idea at a time. But after we already had our first hit game, it was time for a little bit of a change and to start uh, 
you know, expanding our production capacity and trying to do many more games at the same time. Uh, not long after this, we were making the CPI video for Acrylic Nails. The game was a collaboration between Crazy Labs and Firescope from the beginning. And there's a whole talk dedicated to it at the last Hyper Games conference, which I highly recommend checking out if you want to learn more about how we built the game. Acrylic Nails was the most downloaded hyper casual game in October 2020. We only finished, finished behind Among Us in the top charts. At this time, we also expanded our partnership with Crazy Labs to help recruit and mentor studios into the Crazy Labs family and help them build hit games like us. We expanded the team, we increased our production capacity, and we were working like hell to keep acrylic nails in the top charts. Here you can see some clips from the game itself. Just to show you a little bit about the kind of style the art experience, the gameplay simplicity, the control mechanics that we were going for. And I'll tell you why this is relevant to a talk about hair dye is that uh, we did use uh, a lot of things that we learned here and that we built here to actually build out head eye itself and again we'll go into that in the coming slides so this is the part of the fire score story that is most relevant to us today and what we want to spend the most time talking about which is of course head eye our third hit game uh, which was released around six months ago and um, it you know head eye is uh, is one of our toughest games that we built, even though uh, when you look at a game like Acrylic Nails, it is a huge technical challenge to build a game like that. It's a huge art challenge. It's a, it's a, it's a developer challenge. And of course, uh, we face a lot of challenges getting it to market as well. Um, and you know, these uh, high production value games tend to be what we're really good at. And we've recognized that and tried to uh, use that moving forward with all of our games ever since Soap Cutting. So Head Eye is a continuation of that. And of course, uh, since this is a little bit more about the story of Firescore and not just Head Eye, uh, there are a couple of small surprises if you haven't heard about them yet that we'll also talk about at the end of the presentation. So let's talk about Head Eye. Um, Head Eye is a game about dying hair. Um, it's a really popular thing, uh, an activity, a real life experience that people pursue. Um, it is largely a female oriented activity, but that doesn't mean that it's limited to women. Uh, there are a lot of men also who do dye their hair and who do also um, not just dye their hair, but post content about it online um, and share, share these activities with their friends. And of course, uh, there's all kinds of viral videos around the activity of dyeing hair. Now, uh, the game itself revolves around hair dyeing, that is coloring the hair and seeing really cool final results. But uh, since we were going with a, with a hair game, we tried to broaden the concept a little bit and we used, uh, you know, a little bit more from the hair salon experience. Uh, we tried to make it as authentic as, you, as we could to uh, take the user through the journey of how you would uh, go through a hair salon experience um, as the hairdresser. So when customers come to you, you uh, you're not just you're not just dyeing the hair, but you're also cutting the hair, you're straightening the hair, you're washing the hair, uh, and you are kind of um, living through the hairdresser experience as you do this. So the game is not just limited to dyeing hair, but also um, you know is a little bit broader than that. So why did we choose hair dye? And as is the case with most of our uh, previous games and even a lot of our attempts at games. Uh, hair, hair, hair dye is a super popular trend so and it's not just a trend it's like a, a real life activity that's pursued by millions of people worldwide um, but at the same time just like acrylic nails it is it was also a super popular trend online uh, during the pandemic especially people had been taking up more uh, homely activities or trying to do things that they did uh, usually they did, that they did outside with the help of a professional uh, they started doing it themselves and so you had a lot of DIY hair dye videos popping up all over YouTube, uh, Snapchat, TikTok, uh, videos with millions and millions of views and 
again, it, it's always a sign when there's not just millions and millions of views, but there's also thousands of creators uh, that are putting out content about this activity, about this subject. That is a big indicator that, hey, this is something worth pursuing or this is worth, something worth looking into at least. Um, the key learning that we had from this experience of, you know, not just hair dye, but also why we did soap cutting, why we did acrylic nails, and then eventually why we did hair dye, um, is that we was, we had developed a the ability to, well, I wouldn't say the ability, but we had developed an understanding that we needed to listen to the market and that the market came first and whatever the market was telling you that it liked, uh, that's kind of where you need to go with your ideas. So even if you're not, say you're not building simulation games or role playing games like we do, but if you're building a runner, you need to be aware of what's happening in the market. You need to be looking at the top charts, seeing the current trends in runners, what they look like, what they feel like, what they play like, how simple they are. And you always need to listen to the market. And that's one of the key learnings of, uh, of how to pick an idea and how to pick an idea to give yourself the best chance of success. So um, the CPI test itself is something very interesting and it's something that we talk about internally a lot uh, about everything that happened since the CPI test, everything that happened in the CPI test and everything that happened even before the CPI test. Uh, so the video for the CPI test itself was completely made in Blender. It was not made in Unity. There was no programming that went into it. It was built uh, by our art director as an animation and uh, it was then put out to test. So uh, it's slightly different from the regular process that we, that we normally follow. We love to make our games in Unity, but here we decided to go with Blender. Um, and Blender is like this heavenly shortcut to build CPI videos, right? And we talk about it a lot that these days you can just build your video and just put out a small build and uh, you know you can test your game but uh, while it is a heavenly shortcut for CPI videos it's like a nightmare a hellish nightmare for the production team because uh, what can happen is that you set your standards way too high sometimes when you build something as an animation and then to translate the look and feel uh, the smoothness the satisfaction that you get from what is a predefined animation and you're trying to build that in unity that can build, be a nightmare for your production team, uh, which is why it took a long time for us to actually replicate the quality that we had in the Blender video into the actual game in Unity. And that became a problem, a sticky point for us because uh, every time we had to kind of bring in an aspect from the video into the game, uh, it was a big challenge. It was a big challenge because um, there were things we didn't know how to do, there were things that had to be learned, there were things that had to be hacked together and fixed and uh, gotten help for and uh, you know it was it was a very challenging process and uh, I would say that, that maybe uh, you know this is something that that you might want to avoid um, but of course it's, it depends from case to case game to game situation to situation for your studio uh, this could be a process that works for you but you should be aware of the challenges that go into actually taking a game from blender into unity um, and like I said replicating the quality was just you know, it was very difficult. The team spent days trying to match the look and feel that we set out in Blender, and uh, a lot of times we ended up in very difficult situations uh, and, and uh, walls and kind of obstacles that we couldn't get past. But eventually, eventually we managed, and uh, you know, we had we had a great game on our hands, and uh, we, we we built out what we knew we could. And part of doing that was looking back at acrylic nails and seeing what worked there, looking back at soap cutting and seeing what worked there. Um, you know, we, we knew that in acrylic nails, it was a more recent game. We had four phases of gameplay. Soap cutting didn't necessarily have so much gameplay. It had just one phase of gameplay where you cut the soap and you swipe it off. Uh, but here we had four phases of gameplay similar to acrylic nails. And uh, what we realized with uh, building these types of games, the simulation games, uh, is that especially in the DIY category is that we need to give the user uh, some kind of freedom to build their own designs and uh, through these four phases of, of gameplay we were able to accomplish that. We also had of course a bonus phase where you could just quickly uh, select a new hairstyle at the end of the level and your dyed hair would form in that hair uh, in that hairstyle. Uh, we of course had VIP levels as we do in most of our games. Uh, our control mechanics are super simple across each step or the tap and drag and it's not something that uh, you know we want the user to think about at all we want them to look at the screen and just be able to play the game um, 
So we, we try to try to keep things as simple as possible and we focused a lot on ease of gameplay and the satisfying effects. Like I said, we had already got past the hurdles of making the visuals look good uh, in Unity and uh, we, man we spent most of our time then focusing on the ease of gameplay and making the effects truly satisfying. Because uh, so having these satisfying effects is something we knew that would tweak the numbers and make the game feel good, give it good retention. Um, and that's something that we, that we really focused on. We tried a lot to stay true to the experience of being a hairdresser, of being in a hair salon, of running a hair salon, of customers coming to you and you know asking you to do different types of hairstyles. We did a lot of research. I can say I'm partly uh, a hair expert now and so is uh, the rest of our team because uh, we spent a lot of time looking at videos about uh, hairdressing and hair dyeing and uh, just the salon experience itself. And we spoke to hairdresser friends and we uh, you know, got information from them about how we could make the experience more authentic. Um, so that when people actually played the game, they were taken back to their experience at the hair salon and they could relate both experiences and enjoy the game more. Because as we know that uh, in hyper casual and especially simulation games, it's important to remain as true to the experience as possible. And so we did that. Um, and you know, we had varying degrees of success in the retention and output tests. It took about one month to get past these stages. We had poor retention to start with as a result of uh, Blender Unity port and you know, we needed a couple of attempts to make the game good enough, uh, playable enough, satisfying enough. Uh, we didn't have enough time to execute con convincing gameplay mechanics at the beginning, but uh, as time went by, uh, you know, we, we used the extra time we made from uh, you know, having just the video tested at the start and actually came back to build some really convincing and satisfying mechanics. We had the same base code that we used for acrylic, acrylic nails. So we ended up saving time uh, there as well. And again, that was some extra time that played into our hands later on because, um, you know, we needed it. We needed it to get the game ready and get it through the retention in our two stages. Moving on to the launch itself, uh, Head Eye had a top 10 iOS launch and was number one on Google Play when we launched as well. Um, this was our third top chart hit game for the company. Um, and in this time, we had tested 60 to 70 games uh, since the first game we ever tested. So uh, it does take a lot of attempts to have multiple hit games. A lot of times what you'll see is that um, you know, a team has certain strengths and those strengths play out in the games that you end up making and hit games that you produce. And our team, we always try to play to our strengths. Um, as you can see, we had three big simulation hits. Of course, we didn't always only build simulation games and test them. We built all types of games, runners, action, arcade, puzzles, but uh, what we really knew how to do well and what we, you know, what we spent most of our time and effort on and what we eventually had most of our success with was the simulation and the role-playing genre. And there was something about making satisfying games that really satisfies us. And that's why we kept doing it. And uh, we had a great amount of success with it. Across our three games and the story of Firescore, we had uh, two, over 200 million downloads. Um, that is a lot of people that were playing our games. And to be honest, uh, coming from where we did, uh, you know, that it's, it's a huge number to pick and it is something that, uh, that you know, is completely uh, a life-changing experience, you could say, to be able to touch the lives of so many people around the world uh, who love playing our games, you know, and that's something that we started off in this industry to do, which is to be able to, to influence the lives of people and to be able to do it at a very large scale. And uh, soap cutting, hair dye and acrylic nails have allowed us to do that uh, beautifully and it was not the only part of our relationship with Crazy Labs uh, you know that we that we were pursuing. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the uh, about another um, avenue of business we began along with Crazy Labs uh, which is the Crazy Hubs Accelerator. So Crazy Labs had has plans to begin accelerators around the world sometime last year and they contacted us uh, to start one in Mumbai. Now of course the pandemic was going on and we couldn't really um, begin a physical accelerator at the time. 
and that plan was put on hold. And uh, very recently, actually in the last three months or so, we were able to start the first accelerator in Mumbai, uh, which is Crazy House Mumbai Accelerator, and uh, we've had it running for the last few months. This is part of Crazy Labs, uh, you know, hubs program that's running everywhere El else in the world. There are about five other hubs currently running and a lot more that are scheduled to start up very, very soon. Uh, Mumbai is the first one that we started in India and in the coming weeks we will have a second accelerator in Hyderabad. Uh, this will be the second crazy hub in India and uh, again we are very excited about the start of the hub. Teams can register and apply uh, for our limited available slots um, in hubs around the world and uh, you know our goal is to accelerate the time it takes to build a hit game. So young teams uh, join us and they want to make a hit game. We have all the knowledge as a large publisher to be able to provide them with the infrastructure, the knowledge, the tools that they need, um, you know, and all the learning they need to, uh, to, to build a hit game. Then we've seen that uh, there can be a lot of success. And uh, part of the hubs program is about bringing the top talent in a geography, in a locality, in a city, in a country under one roof and uh, bringing them under one roof to uh, training them or uh, providing them with knowledge, workshop sessions or uh, be able to teach them uh, everything that we know about hyper casual games. We've seen that when you bring such talent under the same roof, you tend to get magic. And uh, when that happens, hopefully you pass some CPI tests and uh, we're seeing some great results in hubs around the world and uh, we're, we're hoping to see some great results in India as well. And uh, we're really excited about the start of the second hub. Um, and of course, there, there will be many more to come. And uh, lastly, but not leastly, of course, so uh, this is a little surprise. If you haven't heard about it, um, but I'm sure many of you have already. Um, but if you haven't, then to expand on the growing partnership between Crazy Labs and Firescore and to grow the the story of Crazy Labs' aggressive expansion into the Indian market. Uh, Crazy Labs recently acquired Firescore. And uh, this is why I'm no longer officially the co-founder of Firescore, but I'm uh, heading the India operation for Crazy Labs uh, along with my co-founder, Karan. And, you know, it's been a very, very exciting time these last few months as we not only had Head Eye, but we started the hub and also uh, we had the Firescore acquisition. And of course, it's a big, huge moment in the lives of uh, a small studio uh, to get acquired by a big publisher. And it's something that we are extremely proud of having been through. And our journey now uh, is slightly different because while we were first merely focused on ourselves and our own studio and our own games and our own success, uh, once you become part of a publisher, the goals are a little bit different. And everything we've been doing with the hub and everything that we're going to be doing uh, with Crazy Labs now revolves around taking what we've learned or assimilating what Crazy Labs has, the massive infrastructure that they have, and building India into one of the biggest game development markets in the world for hyper casual. And that's where we focus our efforts on. Uh, that's where we want to spend our time. That's where Crazy Labs and us, we see the maximum value uh, where we can impact at the, at the largest of large scales in the biggest of big ways one of the biggest countries that exists for game development. And we're only just starting to scratch the surface of what we can do. Uh, the acquisition is just the beginning of what we have coming up. Uh, so I'd like to uh, just wrap this up with maybe a, a thought about hyper casual in general, everything we've learned from our story at Firescore, and uh, you know maybe maybe something that, that we want to leave you thinking about. It's that uh, hyper casual has grown over the years, it's become bigger and bigger and bigger. It doesn't show any sign of stopping. It's made games accessible. It's made more people gamers than ever before. And uh, everyone still kind of asks, when is hyper casual going to die? Right? So, what I want to ask today is maybe it's not the question of when is hyper casual going to die. Maybe it's a question of when is everything going to become hyper casual. And that's the thought I want to leave you with. Of course, you'll have some thoughts and comments on it. So feel free to ask any questions or, you know, uh, refute anything you've heard, but uh, I would love to chat with you further and I would love to take any questions you may have. So thank you and I'll stop now for questions.